Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Glad to see you all today also in the second day of our series on the essential biodiversity variables. On Monday, we had a good talk on the concept mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about it. Today, we will be looking at measuring the essential biodiversity variables, a work example, and hopefully tomorrow, we will look at some complexities and perhaps how we could build on just for West Africa or Africa largely. Um, we do have about 17 people online at the moment. 17. So perhaps we could start down what yeah. you think. Sorry, say again, Alex. You muted, Alex. We have about 20 people online at the moment, and I am of the view that we can start such that we will have ample time before even you could leave before the two or three minutes before nine. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to mute everybody just to reduce background noise, okay? And there we go. So now everybody should be muted. Uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and, and ask questions, uh, but please keep your microphones off and that way um, everyone can hear. Okay, so this is a this is a, a tough challenge today because the idea is to look at measuring um, EBVs and essentially how far can we get in an hour and a half? Um, we definitely can't do all six. In fact, we definitely can't do one completely. But what we can do is uh, work within one that. Uh, several of us know very well, uh, Alex and John are both leaders across, across Africa in uh, generating uh, and sharing primary biodiversity data. Uh, <clears throat> and as we talked about on Monday, those data are, are key to uh, several of the EBVs, but particularly to uh, to the ones about species populations. And so we're just going to talk very generally about how do you um, map distributions and uh, visualize species diversity and visualize uh, even species co-occurrence. And so I picked a country out of a hat. Uh, Alex suggested that West Africa, given the um, the title of this course. So I picked a West African country out of a hat and the winner is Nigeria. Um, so we're just gonna play with Nigeria this morning. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. <clears throat> and we're gonna use only one data source. There are, there are more data sources that you may wish to take advantage of. Um, but but we're just going to use what is clearly the largest, um, which is called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And as you can see, it, it currently serves access to 1.6 billion uh, primary biodiversity data records. That's a lot. Now, it's not, it's not evenly distributed across all taxa and across the face of the earth. So if we look at the face of the earth on GBIF, <clears throat> in a moment we'll see it, I hope, um, 
<clears throat> but if we if we look at um, the distribution of these data, just like I showed you on Monday, the distribution is densest in Europe and North America. You can see that with the <clears throat> the dark red color here. Um, <clears throat> you can see that Australia is doing pretty well. But then you can also see this kind of diagonal that goes uh, southwest to northeast across uh, the face of the of the earth. <clears throat> and of course, it passes right through Africa. Um, so that means that you will um, be struggling with data density kind of at all times, which is to say um, you do not have the luxury of simply massive data that are sufficient to meet your needs. And so tomorrow we'll talk about um, some of the ways, some strategies towards meeting the data challenges. Because as you'll see, the analysis challenges to derive some of these EBVs, they can be, they can be uh, feasibly met if you have the data. Okay, so we want to play with um, a country. And as I said, uh, I picked Nigeria out of a hat. And <clears throat> so that's an interesting thing right there. What do you see? You see, an occurrence in Nigeria in South America. You see some occurrences over here in maybe Cameroon or Gabon. You see some East African occurrences, a few scattered across the East Indies and a few in Northern Europe. Um, there's really no good reason for that. Um, other than a phenomenon that uh, Alex and I will talk with you about um, tomorrow, a phenomenon called data leakage, in which good data um, turn bad because the data are mishandled or are not refereed sufficiently um, for whatever reason. Um, data get lost along the way. So I'm zooming in a bit and you can see the kind of what you'd expect. Um, most of the data from Nigeria are focused along the coastal fringe and then less and less as you go inland. Anybody know what this point is? It's an interesting one. You get the grand prize, which is a congratulations and a thumbs up, uh, if you tell me what this point is. It happens to be one of the most densely sampled points on the whole face of the Earth, at least according to these databases. Nobody going to take a guess? OK, I'll give you a clue. Its longitude runs through Ghana. And its latitude, pay attention, runs through Equatorial Guinea. Anybody willing to take a try? This is the point where if you don't have a latitude and longitude for your data record and you put, instead of blank, blank, if you put zero, zero, you create a record right here, because that is the point where the prime meridian and the equator meet. So no, not many people have, have been to this place to, to sample biodiversity, but it is one of the most frequent latitude-longitude combinations in all of GBIF. Now, Alex will remember when we, when we taught a course in, uh, in Accra, uh, we had a very distinguished guest named John Wachorek, 
who has led the development of many of these, these biodiversity databases uh, <clears throat> and has pioneered all of the, the georeferencing protocols that we use right now. And when John was given an option to um, pick an activity for his one day off, I think it was a Sunday in the middle of the course, um, John said he wanted to go to the beach. There were two reasons. One is that he's an expert with beach volleyball and he wanted to see if he could get involved in a game on the beach in Accra. But the other was he said he wanted to swim as far out into the Gulf of Guinea as he could to get as close as possible to this point. Okay, I think I saw a hand raised. Yes, gorgeous. Yes, hello, Professor. What, what's up? I'm fine, sir. Good, good, good. So about the point you talk about, I want to ask if you are talking about uh, the non-data value. Well, yes and no. No data value should be just blank, that there is nothing in that field. Because almost anything else can be misinterpreted. And so, yes, it, it's a value that people use to indicate no data, but mistakenly they think that zero comma zero is an informative no data value. And really zero zero refers to a place on the earth. And so for that reason, we don't wanna use that. We'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow about problems that exist in our data. Okay, and essentially okay. things that keep us from using the full force of the data that we have. So, okay. Uh, but yeah, you're okay, right. You. It's a no data value. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay, I'm going to keep going. And uh, so we have Nigeria. And you can see that from Nigeria, we have only 211,000 records with coordinates, okay? In all, we have 314,000, but not all of them have geographic coordinates. <clears throat> um, let's keep it to map. And I just wanna point out a couple of things that might be of interest tomorrow. Anybody have an idea why these points are here? It's an interesting one. Remember, this is zero, zero. And if we were to plot a line of latitude equals longitude, that line would run like this, right? And so if somebody is, re is creating a data record for this place in Nigeria, but types in latitude for longitude and longitude for latitude, then that point is gonna come out over here. It's gonna be reflected across this line of equal latitude and longitude. And so my guess is that all of these points, which in their text say Nigeria, they're probably indeed good Nigerian records, but they, um, they are mirror imaged across this line of equal latitude and longitude because somebody switched latitude and longitude. Again, we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, data leakage. Okay, so we have these data records and then just for simplicity, uh, I'm going to say, let's work with birds. And no, I didn't pick birds randomly. Uh, it's the group that I work with. Um, and it's also probably the best sampled major group of, of um, animals or plants. Um, in Nigeria, we have 44,000 records. I want you to watch that number decrease. In fact, I'm gonna write it down um, just so I can refer back to it, okay? So 
44,171. I'll remind you of that, of that number as we go. Okay, this is a very basic query. It's basically saying, give me all birds from Nigeria. I probably want to specify my base of, basis of record. Um, and there are some that we definitely want to avoid. Unknown, you know, if you can't tell me why you think that species is there, I don't know that I want to use that record for much. Fossils, I definitely don't want to use those. But preserved specimens in museums, yes. And let's see, I've just lost that list. Here we go. Um, material sample, that's another one that's very nebulous. Human observation, yes. And observation, well, the, there are none in that category. I do not trust the machine observation. And that's not just because I'm old fashioned. It's because I've looked at a lot of data sets and I've seen a lot of errors in the machine observation category. This is essentially an automated interpretation of a recording. So we're gonna go with these two and notice that we're down to 40,509, okay? Things have already started to erode. But, but this is probably a good place to, uh, to download our data. And so to use GBIF, you have to create an account and you can see I'm signed in and I'm just going to hit download. You're given a few different uh, options. The species list doesn't get used for very much. The Darwin Core Archive option has every field. So it's literally two or 300 fields. And so you're not gonna use that unless the simple uh, doesn't fulfill your needs. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and download simple. Did anybody notice that the number came back up? That's because I'm not just uh, taking the 44,000 records uh, that I was mapping, but I'm taking all the records, including the ones that don't have coordinates. So I'm gonna hit this simple and I'm gonna indicate, yes, I understand that I have to cite the data that I use and abide by the, the GBIF user agreement. Um, and so I hit that and I'm taken to this page of under processing. And it's worth paying attention to this page. Um, notice this citation. Okay, if you're gonna use these data, you do need to cite them because these are data that people around the world have dedicated heart and soul to uh, the observation, to uh, digitizing the data record, and then have shown the good faith step of sharing the data. So indeed you do need to cite your source as we do in all science. Um, and GBIF has done uh, several things that are very smart. One is just giving us this citation that we can copy and paste directly into our, our document. <coughs> and then the other thing that's very nice is providing this DOI, so a digital object identifier. And DOIs are at least ostensibly permanent. And so you can publish your paper and you can, um, sorry, and, and somebody five years later can come back, follow that link, and come to your same data set. Then one other thing that I'll point out is notice that we just did a data query that pulled in data from 48 different data sets, okay? And this is a, this is a, a technology that, um, that was developed 20, 25 years ago 
Uh, you can call it distributed database technology. <clears throat> it's a little bit uh, evolved and abstracted in GBIF, uh, but it's a really fascinating thing where instead of having to go to 48 different institutions and do 48 separate queries, we have it all in one place. So we'll talk about that more tomorrow as well. Okay, so you saw that my screen shifted and that basically said that the query was done. Uh, you can, by the way, see exactly what your query was. So you're seeing that I wanted under base of, basis of record, either a preserved specimen or human observation and from Nigeria, and that it was a presence record rather than absence record, and that the scientific name refers to the class Aves. And so you can see all the different data sources that we've just hit. So uh, bird specimens in the Museum of Nature and Human Activities in Japan, one record. Whereas, let's see the big ones. Well, here's one with iNaturalist with its 1,492 records. There's probably one other big one, which is, there we go. Uh, the eBird observation data set, 33,322 records. <clears throat> so now we have, now, now I need to download this. And just in case anybody is wondering, I do have a backup version of, of this analysis uh, that I've already done. So in case something fails, um, we, won't be, we won't be stranded with nothing to do. Okay, there's our data set right there. Now, GBIF, um, like everything human has some problems and some, some uh, complexities to it. You can see that this file name has the suffix of .csv and that indicates comma delimited text. This is not a CSV file. This is not a comma delimited text file, okay? It's a tab delimited text file. And whoever in GBIF uh, has been going for 20 years without fixing this. I don't know what the problem is, <clears throat> but it's a problem that's been pointed out 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago. Um, and there's just a point where I just work around it. So I wanna look at these data. If I just uh, double click on that and open it with Excel, I will get into trouble. So I need to instead, um, do a different tactic, which is this import. And this will allow me to select the type of file that I want to import. Now see this one, if I do it with comma separated values, I lose, it's gonna be a mess. And so instead I'm gonna come down here, um, text files which work, which import best when separated by tabs or spaces and I'm gonna to get to choose. So I'm gonna hit import. I'm going to, let's see, it's in downloads. It's this, get the data. Now it says, is this a fixed width or delimited file? Fixed width would be the first five characters are one field and the next 13 characters are another. We're not doing that. We're in delimited. And you see, if we were to do commas, it would not split up the field because it's tab delimited. But if we do tabs, we can see it splitting up these fields. Okay, and that's what we want. So I'm gonna bring this in just the way it is and I'm gonna hit finish. This is 
45,000 records, if you remember. So it'll take a moment. You can see the progress bar. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, you have AX, so something like uh, 50 or 60 fields. I guarantee you we don't need them all, okay? And I'm just gonna go through and get rid of some fields that I know I don't need, okay? I don't need the data set key, the occurrence ID. I'm gonna keep the GBIF ID because that's a unique identifier. I don't need kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, but I do want the species name. Um, I'm an ornithologist, not a uh, botanist. And so we don't use very much uh, the authority information. Uh, there are a few confusions, but um, most all of the time, we just don't need to deal with that. Um, so I'm fine with just the Latin binomial. I'm going to get rid of the infraspecific epithet. I'm going to get rid of these more complex um, scientific names. Now, you, for your analysis, you may need to keep some of these, okay? In fact, I guarantee you, you need to keep some of these. But I want to make this a manageable um, table for us to play with. I'm going to very quickly go down to just the localities that, well, actually, I'll, I'll leave these for the moment. Um, but I'm going to get rid of these fields. Okay, there's latitude and longitude. I want that. Um, I probably want day, month, and year because I may want to filter based on that. And then I think all the rest are things that I don't need for what we're doing today. Okay. Although there's some interesting information there. And we just, we simply don't have time today um, to deal with that. So I, I've reduced my data table, but I need to reduce it some more. Because look, here's a record that doesn't have a latitude or longitude record. But notice that this record does not also have state, province, or locality. So I can't do anything with that record, and I want to get rid of it. But I bet you that we'll find a few records See, there's one that's just referred to Nigeria. Here's one that's indeed, it's referred to a place. Basita, or ba, uh, I don't know how it'd be pronounced. Um, but that is potentially something that you could find. And so if you really care about this record or these four records, you could save them. And in fact, if you look here, there's a latitude longitude value for Basita. And so I could potentially trust that and copy it and paste it for these other records. Okay, in fact, for a lot of other records. Uh, now there's some things that we should worry about. Look at that and that, two different latitude longitude combinations for one place. Okay, so I'm not going to do this right now. I just want you to know that if you really value those records that are missing latitude and longitude, then you can take the day or the week or the month or the year of work that it may take to add that information. Okay, so that's why I didn't get rid of country, locality, and state at the outset. I wanted you to see that some of the data can be rescued and used. And we'll talk about that with, with data leakage tomorrow. But for now, I just want to do this, this kind of initial playing with measuring an EBV. Is there a question? OK. OK, so one of the things I need to do, OK, please mute your, your microphone if you don't have a question. One of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the all of the records that don't have latitude and longitude because we definitely don't have time to do that uh, work 
today. And so I'm going to sort, sort by latitude. And you can see I have increasing values down to here. And then I have all the records with no data. Okay, and I'm gonna just delete all of those records. And again, some of those records have locality information and you could get them and use them. Okay, then I wanna do another thing. Notice this taxon rank. Okay, taxon rank is saying, how precisely was okay. this identified? And for bird people, if our if it's identified to species, that's that's enough. However, if it's identified only to genus, uh, that's not good. So let's let's look at this. Look at that. Here is a record of a bird from Nigeria. No specification beyond that. Family form, which is a domestic form, uh, and genus, all of these are not identified to species. And I really don't want them in my data set. All the way down to right there. And I'm going to get rid of those. OK. So now we have, I think, things that have all been identified either to species or subspecies. And it's fine if it's identified to subspecies. And so guess what? I don't need this column anymore. And in general, you'll find that the smaller your data table, the easier your life is. Now, I typically save version. So I would have, at every step of this analysis, I would have saved this as Nigeria 1, Nigeria 2, Nigeria 3. And that way, if I mess up, I can always go back one version or three versions or whatever, and I can, I can fix the mistake that I made. But I'm not doing that for today. Now, one more data cleaning thing we want to do is as regards this column here, which is coordinate uncertainty in meters. And let's look at it. Let's sort in descending order this coordinate uncertainty term. Did that work? No. There we go. So you'll find that a lot of these data don't have coordinate uncertainty measures. If we, um, if we don't trust coordinate uncertainty equals blank, we have only 2,199 records for Nigeria and we won't have a very interesting product. So for right now, let's just trust the no data uncertainty me measures as being fairly detailed. And maybe they're not, but we're, we're going to make that decision just out of practicality. Now, is this record truly precise to one meter? No. Somebody was probably um, overestimating the precision associated with the GPS record. But look at this record. And in fact, all of these records that have coordinate uncertainty values that are kind of in the tens of thousands. Well, though that's awfully, awfully coarse. And so I'm going to get rid of those because I, I want to work at something around the precision of, of 10 kilometers, which would be 10,000 meters. OK, so I'm going to get rid of these records. And now everything that I have has a coordinate uncertainty of either 10,000 or less or blank. And again, if you don't trust those blank coordinate uncertainties, you're probably smart, but you're also going to be hurting for data. So it's a, an explicit assumption that I'm making.
Okay, how many records do we have now? 39,851. We started with 44,000. So we have lost just over 10% of the data. Okay, that's not good. But we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. And in fact, now I'm going to go ahead and get rid of uh, the coordinate uncertainty column and day and month. And of course, I would save a version so that I don't lose something if I made a mistake. Now, maybe we want to also get rid of very old records. And so we might want to sort based on date, the year. And let's see what we get. Oh, it didn't seem to sort. There we go. So pretty neat, um, a couple records that go back to the 1800s. You know, and maybe in your report, you wanna say from 1950 to present. So let's go ahead and delete those, okay? Now, all of the different analyses that you will want to do are analyses that, that you will design these, these steps individually, you know, customized, because your analysis is your analysis. There's no recipe. But I just wanted to show you these steps because these are data cleaning steps. So I'm going to call this, let's call this Nigeria. I'm going to actually just call it N1 because I, I have some Nigeria data sets that I set up to save us if we get into trouble. Um, so I saved it as an Excel file so I can come back to it easily. And then I'm also going to save it easiest as a tab delimited text. And it's gonna say, do you really wanna use a format like that? And I say, yes. Okay, that's one platform. We just used Excel, okay? All of my students make fun of me cruelly and unnecessarily for using Excel for things. But if you know how to use it, and if you're careful, uh, it can be very useful. And those, those of you who've been in the BITC classes, you know we use tools like that because they're on every computer, okay? And if I were to say, you know, let's use Microsoft Access, probably half of you won't have it, okay? Um, if I were to say, let's use R, which is what my students use, probably half of you, or I don't, I don't know, maybe even three quarters of you don't have experience with R. I don't, okay? I have not had time to learn it, or maybe I'm not smart enough, but um, R is extremely powerful. And, um, you know, I recommend you pick that tool up if you can. But for right now, we're done with one of our platforms for the moment. Now, I want to go to a GIS platform. And I realize fully that not all of you have GIS experience. And if you do, then great. And if you don't, uh, please just be patient, OK? Uh, I'm not doing anything that's particularly difficult if you've had uh, GIS training, and that's something that you can uh, that you can get. Okay, so I'm showing you this just so you get the the general idea. But basically, you know, here's a here's a, a vector format data layer that shows us the countries of the world. It's unprojected, which is to say, it's in geographic coordinate systems. Um, and that's very bad if you're measuring distances or areas, but it's also very neutral if you're dealing with biodiversity data. So my recommendation is to work unprojected, which is uh, usually WGS 1984, um, while you're processing your data 
And then when you get to the point of wanting to measure areas and things like that, um, then you can project to maybe an equal area projection and get your area measurements correct. Okay, so I isolated an outline of Nigeria and that's this. Now, um, we need to see those data that we just processed. Uh, by the way, QGIS is a, is a free GIS platform. Uh, I recommend it very highly. It's under active development. It's well supported. Um, each version brings new capacities and fixes old errors. Um, it's not perfect. Um, I find QGIS to be excellent for vector operations and mostly functional for raster operations, but I will confess that there are things that I use ArcGIS for when I'm working with rasters. So uh, this is the best freeware GIS platform that I know of, I recommend. Okay, so let's go and find that n1.txt file. It's right there. And we look at the format, we see what the delimiters are, custom delimiters tab, that's correct. You have to check this stuff. Uh, first record has field names, yes. Now geometry definition, I definitely have coordinates. So I touch point coordinates and it says, is the X field longitude, decimal longitude and is the Y field decimal latitude, yes. So I should be able just to bring this right in. Add, and look at that, I have data. Now, once again, what we want to do is make sure that we have data that are not laden with errors, okay? Now remember, we've gotten rid of all the stuff that wasn't well identified. We've gotten rid of all the stuff that, um, that had big coordinate uncertainty, but we never checked to make sure that all of our points were inside of Nigeria. And you can see some of these, which are offshore, and those may be uh, marine birds. We see at least one point that's over here in Cameroon, um, but I'm gonna zoom to the full extent of my point layer. And uh-oh, I see my good friend. No, that's not a zero, zero, that's just far offshore but I see these points up here um, that passed the coordinate uncertainty filter, but I know those are crummy points. And so I'm just gonna do a little trick, which is to say, I hope this works quickly, by the way. In fact, I'm gonna save my project just in case it doesn't. Um, but I'm going to go to, select by location. And so I want to select the features from N1 that are within the features of Nigeria outline. And I want it just to select those, okay? And let's see what happens when I do this. Hopefully it'll happen pretty quickly. Run, there we go. Now what I want you to notice is that these, the records in Nigeria are now bright yellow. And these records up here and the offshore records and the Cameroon records are not, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and export this, save my selected features only as, now the logical thing for me to name this is obviously N2, okay? This is how I do my research when I'm doing these long, um, these long analysis strings. And so now notice that N1 includes all of those records outside of Nigeria but N2 doesn't. So I'm gonna remove N1 from my 
my GIS view. And I'm going to zoom to N2. And notice that now all of my records are in Nigeria. OK? Now, I want you to notice the clustering and clumping, like this, OK? That's a lot of precise points piled up on each other, OK? Now, those might be organized surveys. Uh, they might be along a road. They might be data errors. I don't know. Um, but I've got some points that are very close to one another. And so you won't always do this. But one thing that we commonly do is to aggregate our data to something slightly coarser than exact points. OK? And so I'm going to do that. Um, I want to create some sort of grid system. And so here's what I'm going to do. And these are, these are decisions that you would optimize for your particular report. Maybe you want to aggregate to counties. I don't know if that's the municipal division within Nigeria. but um, Or you maybe want to use a square grid system of you know, five by five kilometers to coincide with uh, some national land use survey, I mean, whatever, okay? But you probably will want to aggregate your data to some degree. And so I'm gonna create a grid, let's use hexagons because that minimizes the centroid to extreme edge difference. Um, I want my grid extent to come from Nigeria outline. And in this case, I want a 10 kilometer um, spacing of my, of my grid hexagons. And so 10 kilometers in degrees is 0 0.90909. OK, Whoop. yeah. And I want to keep it in geographic coordinates, WGS84. And I'll just let it create a temporary data layer. So good. I go down here and hit OK. And it's done. And look at that. It looks like a honeycomb. OK, I can make that transparent so that you can see it. OK, there's our grid. Now notice all it did was to take the maximum latitude and the maximum longitude of Nigeria. And so I want to refine my grid a bit using the same select by location that I use for the points. And I want to say, keep only the grid squares that intersect the features of Nigeria outline. OK, and now I definitely want to save the selected features as a grid. And so I'm going to call this uh, and grid number one. Remember, I number everything so that I can go back to a previous version. OK, so now I can clean up and get rid of the temporary file. And now, look what I have. I have a honeycomb grid that's going to allow me to take maybe all of these points and aggregate them to one place. If I don't aggregate, or if I use a really, really fine, um, fine grid, then I will have almost no information in any one grid cell. And if I go too coarse, if I use you know, a 100 kilometer grid instead of a 10 kilometer grid, then I, I'm going to lose a lot of information. So uh, just because I'll be aggregating too much. But again, this gridding process is something that you can do based on your needs and your interests as you develop your EBV. 
Okay. Okay, so now what I want to do is aggregate my occurrence data, my 40, 38,000, 39,000 occurrence records. I want to aggregate them to this grid, which is to say I want to be able to see them in terms of which grid cell they're in instead of what is their latitude longitude. And so I'm going to use this um, point sampling tool, which is very useful in QGIS. It's a plugin, so you have to load it. In ArcGIS, this would be extract point, extract values to grid, or something like that. So extract values to point. And so I'm going to keep all of the data in my point data. Okay, please mute your microphone. Okay, I'm going to step out for just a second and uh, mute everybody. Let's see. Mute all. There we go. Okay. okay. I'll go back to sharing my screen. Okay. So as I said, what I want to do is to add the identifier for the grid squares to each of my points. So here's all of my point data, all of the, the data associated with N2. And then for N grid one, I just want the ID of the grid cell. And I have to tell it my uh, the name of the shapefile that I want. And this is obviously going to be N3. And so here we go. Up. Oh, I don't want a geo package. That's a new data format that I don't know yet. So I want to use shapefile, not, not geo package. I'm glad I saw that. Okay, so it's going through, and for each of the points, it's assigning the grid square ID value to each of those points. And it's done. I should have shown you this before, but just so you get an idea of what those ID values are, I can go ahead and label them for you. So you see um, number, it doesn't look like there's number one, it doesn't matter, but two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve, da, 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 da. And so it just goes through and gives a consecutive identifier. And so these three points are all going to get the value 71. And in fact, let's go ahead and make sure that they did. So I'm gonna select those three points. And I'm going to open the attributes table. OK, actually, those were three geographic points that correspond to 81 records. And hopefully, they'll all have the ID number of 71. And you see they do. OK. OK, so now we have our, these are our original data, the GBIF ID, the species, latitude, longitude, year, and now the grid ID number. And so I'm gonna cut, uh, I'm gonna take that table and I'm going to copy it. And I will note that when you deal with really big data sets, QGIS doesn't do this step very well. Um, and that's one reason to keep your, your, the number of columns in your table very few. Uh, but you have to check when you paste this into, guess where we're going, back to Excel. Uh, you have to check and make sure 
that there isn't like a compaction of fields in some of the records, that this should be okay. You see, we've got a few IDs missing, and that's something that if I had more than an hour and a half, I would fix for you. Um, but let's go ahead and get rid of those values, those, those IDs that are not uh, specified. And again, if you were doing this for a publication or for a report or something, you would fix them in advance. You see, there's just five records. I'm going to just get rid of them. Okay, so now we have our species records. We have the GBIF ID that we don't really care about unless we need to go back to the record. We have latitude, longitude, we have year, but really all we want is what's the set of species known from each of our grid squares. And so I'm gonna use a, a little trick. Um, it's called a pivot table. And it's going to create, it's going to use that data set. It's going to start a new worksheet. And on this worksheet, what I want is the grid ID in the rows. And I want the species in the columns. Yeah, okay. Give me a moment. I forgot to do one step, so I'm going to get rid of this sheet. Um, I always add one field, which is appropriately named dummy. And dummy is just a counter, OK? And so I just set it at 1. You'll see why in just a moment, OK? Now I can do that same step of inserting a pivot table. I want the grid ID as the row. I want the species name as the column. Oops, sorry. Species ID as the column. And sometimes you have to go in and clean up stuff. Okay, and then um, I want dummy as not the sum, but maybe the maximum value. And we know that the only value that dummy has is one. And so now look what I have. I have a matrix, which is the species by the grid cell. Now, this looks funny. Um, in fact, it's a very empty matrix. Looks like Ocipiter badius is very common, and Ocipiter manilis is very rare. Now, obviously, we would probably quality control all the, all the scientific names and everything if we were doing this for, for publication. Uh, but we're just doing this as an example. And so you see we have something around 100 grid squares, and we have the species. Now, you will see in the literature a reference or many references to what's called a presence-absence matrix, or a PAM. Presence-absence matrices are the nexus of biodiversity data analysis. And so my friend Jorge Soberon, um, he works with PAMS, presence absence matrices, much of his research work. You can do conservation prioritizations with a PAM. You can do a nestedness analysis. You can do uh, niche models if you add place uh, descriptors. You can do richness descriptors. So this matrix is is a really important kind of nexus for everything we're gonna do in biodiversity informatics. So I just wanna make sure you appreciate how cool this 
this particular um, this particular data uh, product is. Now, what I want, okay, question from Jean. I'm gonna I'm moving fast because I'm gonna run out of time. But go ahead, Jean. Thank you very much. This remember me uh, because on data completeness analysis. Okay, we follow uh, last time with you. Thank you very much. But now I I, I, I realized that you shift from uh, square cells to hexagons to square. But you, you explain it uh, so quickly and I want to understand more why uh, you are no more using square cells. Okay, if you, if you take the distance from the center of a square cell to one of the edges of that square cell, Okay, let me stop sharing. So take the distance from, you have your square cell, the distance from the center to one of the flat edges yeah. versus the distance from the center to one of the corners. So there's a 40% longer distance yeah. from the center to the corner than the center to the edge. Yeah. And so right. that means that your square is is not very cohesive, okay? The most cohesive thing would be a circle because all of the distances are the same. But you can't make a grid out of circles that covers a whole region. There'll be little gaps. Hexagons are the best uh, alternative because they can be combined to form a complete net across a region, but they have less variation in that distance to the edge as you go around okay thank you very much so that's that why you. thank you thank you you can use much. a square grid system and in fact you should use a grid, square grid system if you're doing something like um re building your data products to match some already existing map that has quadrants on it okay thank you thank you very much okay i'm going to keep going yeah. Okay, so here's our PAM. You now know that term. And I'll provide you guys with a paper um, by Jorge Soberon, which I call the unified PAM field theory, because it's a lot like uh, the unified field theory in physics, where one thing is a nexus for understanding many things. But for right now, I just want to take this PAM and I want to capture all of the presence absence matrix. And I want to put it in a new table, new sheet. And I'm gonna, what I really wanna do is just to sum across all of the fields because I'm just trying to get you a map of known species richness. So I'm gonna put equals sum, and then I want this whole row all the way back to column B. You can see there were several hundred species. We'll get there. Thank you for your patience. Actually, I'm being silly. Watch. I know that it's, I can just write this, this, it's from column B2 to column BFQ2, okay? Okay, so if I propagate this sum down, of course, I don't remember how many rows I had. Okay.
Okay, so now, what do I have? I'm gonna compact this. What I have is for each, ugh, for each, I can't even see it. Um, there it is. That's a known species richness for each of those grid squares. I'm working fast because I don't want to run out of time. I want to show you guys a final map. Um, but Here is the table. I'm just going to skip over all of these messy uh, species names. And so now what do I have? But I have a two column table, which is the row ID from the, uh, the hexagon grid and the number of species recorded in each of those grid hexagons. Okay, we're almost there. Again, please remember this PAM, the presence absence matrix, that can take you to a plethora of analyses and exciting insights. Okay, that is a really powerful data set. But we're just going to work with this for right now. So notice, I don't have latitude, longitude anymore. I have the grid IDs, okay? So I'm gonna save this as another text file. Let's be imaginative and call it N4. I'm gonna save it as tab delimited text. And I'm gonna go back to QGIS. I'm gonna turn off all my points. I'm gonna bring in another delimited text file. It's gonna be this n4.txt. There it is. I look at it, yeah, it's tab delimited. Yeah, yeah, all good, but it says point coordinates and it's like, where are the point coordinates? And you guys and I know I don't have any. So I say no geometry. I'm saying just import it as a table, okay? So now I have this table that I can't look at. But what I can do is link it to the grid that I have. And so I'm gonna go into my grid. I'm gonna to go to this area, which says manage joins. I'm gonna add a join. I want to join my N4 table in my N4 uh, table, I want this row labels, and I want to join that in the, the grid coverage to its ID, right? So I do that. And now let's look at the attributes table to our grid. And it didn't work. See, this is why you never ever do a live demo. You get to 20, 20 minutes before your end and the darn thing doesn't work. Let's see, what did I do wrong? Let's just try it again. There it is. You know what I did? I forgot to hit OK. OK. There's no accounting for people being dummies, and and uh, computers don't don't um, brook dummies very well. Now notice right away, some of the species totals are null, and that means zero species recorded. Okay. 
That is a fact of life. Let's look at this and see what it looks like as a map. So I'm gonna to go to symbol. I'm gonna to go to graduated. I'm gonna say I wanna look at this species number. And yeah, let's look at a color ramp from white to red. And let's classify it by quantile. So every point along this spectrum will have equal frequency of, of numbers. And it looks like that. I can raise the number of classes. Okay. And let's see what this looks like. Okay, there we go. Now, let me just fix up the visuals just a bit. If I make this instead of orange, if I make it something gray, like that. There we go. So, what do we see? We see lots of species known from across the south and in the center. What the, the Institute of Ornithology is there in Jos, and the capital is there. But in parts of the north, we have no records at all. Okay. In some of the really remote areas along the Cameroonian border and things like that. So is this a perfect um, is this a perfect addressing of the species population's uh, EBV? No, but it's one thing that you would want to look at if you were addressing that EBV, which is to say, here is known species richness. Now, there's a lot more to do. Let's say, um, let's say I was to say, let's say I'm the president of Nigeria, and I say to all of the Nigerians on this call, okay, I'll give you a million dollars and your task is to develop uh, EBVs for Nigeria. Probably what you should say is no thank you, okay? But if you wanna take this on, then what you want to do is to start developing some data products. And a data product like this, which is a state of knowledge mixed with species richness, this is something you're gonna to wanna to develop along the way, okay? Now, probably what you ought to do is get $10 million and, and begin your own biological survey to fill in those gaps, okay? But my point is that you do, you, you can't just say, okay, I'll work for six months and I'll have all of your EBVs in place. These get worked on one at a time. These get worked on with a lot more attention to detail and a lot more um, precision and checking than what I did today. Okay, what I did today was designed to show you in one hour and um, 15 minutes how to get from data online to an interesting map of bird species richness knowledge across one country. Okay, so this is a start. If I were doing this, or if you were doing this for publication or for, um, you know, as part of your job as head of the Nigerian Biological Survey, um, you would do it much more carefully. And you'd probably take a month to do what I just did in a, an hour and 15 minutes. And that's okay. Data cleaning is crucial. Um, but it's a start. And I wanted you to see that it is very feasible. And if you don't know GIS or, or if, if I was moving too fast for you in Excel, those are all skills that either you can pick up or you can find people who, who, um, who have those skills. You know, it's amazing that I'm still able to publish in my field, even though I don't know R. My students are all experts with R and laugh at me and, and make fun of me cruelly because I don't have R. Um, but I get to work with them, and so I can stay functional. I can also do a fair number of things using simple free tools like I just showed you. 
any questions, uh, perhaps not about the details of how I did what I did, but rather the big picture. I think that's the most important thing right now. No questions at all. Do you think, raise your hand if you think you could do this. If I gave you a month, could you do this for your country? Okay, Gladys looks like she can. Uh, or is that a question, Gladys? Okay, we have two people who could do There's it. There's not a question. Okay, two people who think they could do it. That's good. I know more of you could do it than that. I certainly know Alex and John could do it. I don't know if Ben's on today, but I suspect that all of you could do this um, with perhaps a little bit of hand holding by a GIS specialist. Um, so don't be shy. I mean, these are things where a very good beginning is just to get on GBIF and look at the data that exists for your country. And you know you can do things like look at on GBIF uh, the distribution by taxon. You know how many birds, how many mammals, how many sipunculid worms, how many plants. And right away you'll get an idea of maybe there's one group that's really really well documented. And so that can be a neat group to start with. You know, if forget about the president of Nigeria, if the minister of the environment or the minister of the interior or, or you know, whatever your country has, if that person comes to you and, and asks you for this sort of work, you'd be amazed at the impact it has just to show them a map, okay? even if it's not a final map, even if it's only for, you know, uh, a certain family of butterflies or whatever, you will find that the impact of showing somebody something that they can look at, and, you know, we all do this. What does it look like um, at my village or at the place where I used to, uh, to live? Or, you know, I've been to this national park. What does that look like? You know, just having those maps available and visible helps quite a bit. Okay, of the people with ha hands raised, are any of those questions? Okay. Well. I hope this has been useful. Um, we are posting. Ah, ha, ha. Somebody's asked a question. Um, how is SDM related to EBVs? Well, so SDM, species distribution modeling, um, I've worked in that area for too many decades now. Um, I use the, the term ecological niche modeling, uh, but they, they generally distill down to very similar things. Um, species distribution modeling or niche modeling is essentially taking those locations for a given species, relating them to the environments uh, present at those locations, and using the distribution of those environments to infer the probable full distribution of the species. And so it's a very good question because let's go back to QGIS. Let's go back to my points and let's turn off my grid and let's look at this species by species.
and let's turn off almost all of them. Seriously. Oh, I hit the wrong button, sorry. That's taking longer than I thought. I just wanted to get you points showing you one, um, one species. There we go. Okay, so there is Zosterops senegalensis. Now we know that this species probably exists in these intervening areas. It may not exist all the way up to the, the northern rim or in the deepest forests or whatever. Um, but we know that this species has a distribution that's larger than this. And so with SDM, what we could do is relate each of these occurrences to the environments present at those places. And then that's, that is essentially the niche model which is why I don't like the idea of a distribution model. But we could then take that niche model and ask, well, those environments where our species is present, where are those environments present? And we might get some area that's larger than this. And so your question is very, very good because I could take the time for those 1,500 species known from Nigeria, I could take the time to build a niche model for each one of them. And then instead of developing a PAM from the points, I could develop it from the niche modeled maps. And that would, it would have advantages and disadvantages. On the advantage side, it would allow us to interpolate and see into areas that haven't been sampled. On the disadvantage side, we know that niche model or distribution model predictions are not perfect. And so we would be incorporating into our PAM the error of over prediction or under prediction that is in each and every ecological niche model. And so you probably want to do both. You probably want to work with the observations and with uh, the interpolated niche model based distributions. And you would do things almost exactly the same way I've shown you how to do today. The only difference is that you would, if you had a set of 1,500 grids, one for each species of bird known from Nigeria, you would. Um, probably create a grid of points and extract the grids as far as presence or absence to each of the points for each grid square, blah, blah, blah. The neat thing that you could also do is not need to aggregate to the hexagons or to the grid squares. You could work at native pixel resolution. So there are some advantages. The disadvantage, the biggest disadvantage is just the time. Uh, it, it would take months of work to do. Um, but it's very doable. So I'm afraid I have to go within a minute or two. Um, any last question burning on somebody's tongue? Well, Dan, thanks for today also. It certainly has been a useful exercise for taking us through a work example we can all attest to the amount of work needed to be able to build efficient and uh, workable EBVs. I think this gives us an understanding of what it takes and tomorrow as we move into complexities and other uh, parts of the essential biodiversity variables. I would like to thank you also for today and colleagues, participants for their time and hope to see you tomorrow too when 
we close on this uh, series of lectures. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.